In this Inspired Insider.com interview, we talk with Jason Womack. He's author of Your Best Just Got Better. He's founder of GetMomentum.co. Have you ever felt distracted? You have too many projects, too many ideas. You get sidetracked. You feel overwhelmed with balancing work and family. He talks about it. He's worked with aerospace engineers, investment bankers, Olympic athletes, startup founders, and many more. That coming up right now. Hi, it's Jeremy Weiss here. We're here with Jason Womack, author of Your Best Just Got Better, Work Smarter, Think Bigger, Make More. He's worked with Olympic athletes, investment bankers, aerospace engineers, startup founders, uh, spoken at Harvard, University of Memphis, and many more. And what we were talking about before is the thing all these people have in common that they talk to him about is they're too busy, they don't have enough time, and they want to get more done. So thanks, Jason, for being here. Hey, Jeremy, thanks for the invitation. And everyone, you know, in the next 20, 25 minutes, we're going to give you the, the good stuff. Here it comes. All right. So we're going to talk about, and this is what everyone asks us, is how we can get more done in less time, not get sidetracked. I know you're the master of productivity. Tell us one of those moments, though, those days that you felt overwhelmed and unproductive so we can kind of feel that pain. God, you know, we've all had them, and, and it's really clear in my mind. It was several years ago. I was in a different profession, different job. I was actually a high school teacher, Jeremy. I was teaching U.S. history, world history, Spanish language, two different levels. And my days were, were never finished. I, I never got to the end of the day thinking, oh, my gosh, I'm done. And there was one afternoon, I went to the classroom, uh, I don't know, I was grading or lesson planning. All I remember is the phone rang and Jody, my wife, she said, Jason, are you coming home for dinner tonight? And I said, yeah, um, I, I got to do a few more things. And when I hung up the phone, I realized, you know, that, that was a Saturday night, man. Wow. I mean, it wow. was like, it was, it was, it, it, it was, the job was eating into everything. Uh, my normal for those five years that I was a high school teacher, my normal was I'd work as much as I could in the classroom. I'd go home, I'd have dinner with Jody, uh, maybe watch a little bit of TV, do a little bit of relaxing, and then somewhere between 10, maybe 10.30, she would go to bed, and I would work till 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, wow. and that went on for about four and a half, five years. Wow. That's, yeah, that's, um, we could all relate to that for sure. Now, I know you're going to teach us some great tactics, things we need to do be to, to be more productive in our daily life, but before, tell us that day, that super productive day that just went so smoothly for you so we know what to look forward to after we listen to all your tactics. Okay. Now, what, what, what I'm going to share with you right now is what's come over many years because during that time as a high school teacher, I dove into and started studying what I thought the problem was, which was time. What you and I are going to talk about tonight is what the goal is, which is productivity. And, you know, I'm, I'm staring here. I got my, my Moleskin journal. We'll talk about tools in just a little bit. But last December, December 7th of 2012, for whatever reason, at the end of the day, I wrote down 32 things that I did that day that were um, beyond productive. They were engaging. They were inspiring. They were productive from a professional standpoint. I mean, I, I did stuff for my job where, you know, we moved the company's mission forward. And then I did stuff on the personal side. And, and I, I just thought I'd just spot check a couple of these. If yeah, definitely. Something there. Um, I, I got up early. I was staying in a hotel in Kansas City. I went over to a coffee shop to set up a little study session. While I was there, I brokered a conversation with the guy next to me. He happens to be another author. And we happen to be in a similar genre. We happen to speak for the same organization. Oh, wow. So it was a real neat, impromptu conversation. Um, I walked through the Apple store and I got a little bit of education from one of the associates right there. A problem that I was all working through on some of my Mac software just happened to be there. I happened to ask the question and, and she happened to know um, what, how I could get help. 
Driving back to St. Louis that afternoon, I stopped at the Harry S. Truman Library. And there I am, I'm walking around, and I almost had this like private guided tour. I mean, it was a Friday, midday, no guests, no other visitors. And so I just went to each of the guards, or the I guess they call them tour guides, and I got this private multi-level tour through the, through the whole um, uh, museum. Two more quick ones, and this was all in one day. Um, I went to dinner at a restaurant. I wound up meeting the owner. She told me the story of her husband passing away. She took over the restaurant business. She built it up. And she was super proud because she was employing 46 St. Louis people with jobs. And oh, wow. in this economy, I mean, the pride that she felt in that. And then the last thing, the last thing that I, I was able to do that day, uh, Jeremy, every month I pick a biography to study, to dive into real deep. And so I spent about 60 minutes that night studying Benjamin Franklin. He was my biography for December. And I tell you, the old way that I was working, I wouldn't have gotten to all of those things in a year, let alone all in one day. And so these are some of the things that you actually, you know, when you went through your ideal day, these are some things you actually did because, again, like years of practice, years of work that you were able to do because you and, and you what learned I hope, this. You know, what I'll do in this is I'll shorten a lot of those learning curves because I, I, I'll figure things out, but sometimes it takes me a long time. I'll, I'll shorten that up for, for everyone watching tonight. Okay, great. So let's dive into it so we can get that result, obviously. What is, if you were to tell someone one thing, someone's like, just give me one thing. What's the top thing I should do to be more productive in the day? What would be the the item that you would tell them to do? First thing that I would suggest is start tracking what's going on. Start tracking the actual results you're achieving now. And Jeremy, I know we talked a little bit before, this is a little counterintuitive. You know, a lot of the people who teach productivity, they actually encourage you to start off with maybe making a to-do list, maybe a projects list. And when I'm working with one of my clients, one of the first things we do is we sit down and we start tracking to find out what's current reality. Right. What's going on that's getting in the way of their being productive? And until they study that, it, it makes it kind of tough. Yeah. So tell me about one of those times that you remember that you did this with the client. What happened? Fantastic. So it, it starts with this premise here that I work from, which is my day, my, my 24 hours of time in a day is actually made up of 96 15-minute blocks. Now, the reason 15 minutes is so important to me, I've got three, uh, a list of three reasons. Uh, the first reason that I focus on 15 minutes is it's about my attention span. So, total right. self-disclosure here. Um, the second reason that 15 minutes is so significant is it's, it's short enough to find. You know, you, you, you'll get in your car to drive to a meeting and there'll be light traffic, so you arrive 15 minutes early. Or you're on time and there's heavy traffic, so the person driving to meet you is 15 minutes late. Uh, another example, and, and Jeremy, I'm just being you know as transparent as I can, but you and I actually had a conversation scheduled last week. Right, right. And upwards of the last minute, I had to change that due to some family circumstances. And so, boom, you had four 15-minute blocks of time that you were suddenly surprised with. Which leads me to the third reason that 15 minutes is so important is it's long enough to matter. So let me give you a specific story of someone I work with. This was a, a manager in the United States Navy and I support uh, the Naval Weapons Station at Seal Beach. I've gotten to do a lot of work there over the past six years. And I work with one division and they're both uh, military enlisted and they are outside community um, consultants. And this one woman that I sat down with, she'd been in that office for upwards of about eight years. We, when I walked into her space, I was going to spend a day with her as an advisor, consultant, kind of taking a look at her workflow and productivity. And man, I'm telling you, there were stacks. There were stacks of papers and, and reports and binders, those big four-inch, you know, those, those huge D-ring binders. We could all relate to that, yes. All over the place. She even had them under her desk. 
And so what we did is instead of shooting all over her, right, you should read all these, or what I've heard other organizers do, which is they kind of put things in a box and put them off to the side and hide them, what I did is I said, look, if you're waiting until you have time to figure out what to do when you have time, you'll pretty much always stay checking email. That's, that's the way I look at it. Right. So instead what we did, and, and the system that she used for her organization, projects, actions, reminders, was Microsoft Outlook. So what we did is we made a separate section of Outlook, her tasks, mm -hmm. where we listed what each of the stacked items was about. Just a noun, something that described it. And then in front of that, I had her put down what would the 15-minute chunk look like mm -hmm. if she were to engage in that three-ring binder, right. in that report, in that manila folder. Now, i got to tell you, the list was long, yeah. but over about, and it took her about seven months, when I went back to her office, clean, clear, and she didn't throw everything away. She actually looked at the items in wow. there chunking it down and this this idea that 15 minutes is a long time if right. I'm fully focused. Yeah. No, I mean I could see myself I see four inch ring binders or piles of paper and it just looks too overwhelming to even want me to touch. So I could see how that if I chunk it and say what can I get done in 15 minutes, you know, as obviously with her she can get it done in 7 months where it probably it would be in my you know, sitting in my corner for, for a while if I didn't do that. What was, um, I love that tactic. What's one with the start tracking now? I want to hear the story, too, about the mid-level manager that you worked with, with the interruptions. Can you tell that story? I think people would appreciate that. This was great. So a lot of my work, and, and for those of you who watched the other Mixer G lesson, I go into a little bit more detail on some other pieces. But one of my main functions as a, a coach, as an advisor, is I go in and I do these workflow audits where literally I watch people work for one, two, or three days. And it's, it's pretty amazing because I get some real insight into not what do the books say we should do, not what does Harvard Business School recommend managers do, but what really happens. Well, before I work with anybody, what I ask them to do is to pick Pick something to track. Um, I've had people track how many meetings they get invited to. I've had people track how many emails they send and receive. Uh, one guy I worked with, he tracked how much water he drank in a day, right? But the story that I want to share is one of my clients who, and all he used was a 3 by 5 note card. And what he did is he wrote down the name of each one of his team members. Over two days, every time one of his team members interrupted him, by phone, by text message, instant message, or coming into his office space, mm -hmm. he just put a little tick mark. Right? So tick, 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 tick. One of his staff members in two days interrupted this guy 27 times. Wow. Now, Jeremy, I don't know about you, but I mean, that's what's that, 13, 13 times a day, right? If I'm sitting here trying to get something done, read a document, work on an Excel spreadsheet, build a PowerPoint deck for the, the, the investors, whatever it is that I'm doing, if I get interrupted by one person 13 times a day, I'm going to wonder how I'm going to get that work done. Right. Yeah, and even I know like when someone interrupts me, it takes me like a few minutes to kind of get back to what I was doing. So that adds up quickly. Some great research, and if I could recommend a book to people, it's a book called Mindset out of uh, uh, by Carol Dweck. She's out of Stanford University here in California. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they've established, the cognitive scientists who've studied workplace performance and productivity, it actually is, it, there's a time gap. If I'm looking at one thing, I get interrupted, focus on that, and come back, it can be one to six minutes to wow. get back the focus I had before the interruption. So wow. think about that the next time you're going to sit down and, and begin working on something. Is there anything you can do before you start to minimize the, the potential of interruption? Right, so he started tracking interruptions. So what was one thing that he did to minimize it? I need, I need to know this. You see my big smile here. Right? <laughs> um, same tool, 
and by the way, sometimes the most low, the, the, the least technological tool, it's still technology, right? Papyrus and, 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 and um, pen. Mm -hmm. um, but what we did is for every one of those staff members, he wrote that person's name on one note card mm -hmm. through the day. When he thought of something to ask that person, he'd flip to that note card, write it down, and then they started in, they started interrupting each other mid morning, mid afternoon, ten to ten thirty, two to two thirty. Now everyone was interrupting each other between two half hour periods of the day, which gave about twelve hours of the day to be as productive as they could be. Love it, love it. Um, so what's the, so I know that you've also worked with some Olympic athletes in business, and I know if it works for Olympic athletes, it works for all of us. What was some of the what was one of the the cases that you worked with with the Olympic athletes that you could talk about? Great question, and, and I work with an Olympic. Uh, I work with a few Olympians, um, f former Olympians. And in all transparency, I get to work with these people who were the best in the world at their chosen sport. Now they were out running businesses, leading community efforts. They were out getting things done in the business world away from their sport. And one client I worked with out in Colorado had uh, she actually won the gold medal in Sydney as a swimmer back wow. in, in when we when the Olympics were in Australia. And one of the things that we looked at was how she would set goals and measurements as an Olympic athlete. Mm -hmm. And she, she was not completely using those over in her business side. So two things that I'd love to share specifically that she moved over to this side of business. One was reminders and two was visualization. And in no particular order, um, let's do the visualization piece. One of the things that she told me was when the Olympians were training as swimmers out in Colorado Springs and other pools, they had this one, uh, one device where if anybody swims here watching this, there's a training tool where you can wrap a belt around your waist and then you can actually attach that belt to a bungee cord and the bungee cord is attached to the pool deck and you swim against the pressure of the bungee cord. Now I've right. seen that one and we talked about it. What this Olympian told me was they actually had another training tool which was a belt around your waist and a rope and the rope was attached to the other side of the pool and Jeremy it would pull them across the pool. Now at first I'm thinking, well wait a minute, why, you know, that's cheating. The right. Yeah. Need to go. And here's what she told me that forever changed the way I looked at goal setting. She said, "Jason, we set the pull of the rope at world record pace. Otherwise, there's no way we would know what it would feel like to swim that fast." Mm. And I thought to myself, how many small business owners, how many managers, how many spouses don't even know what it would feel like if they had one of these uber productive days? Right. So how do you do it? We start visualizing. And I'm going to talk about that at the end of this, the tactic I would use to visualize that productive part to go toward it. Um, can I talk for a moment about reminders? Yeah, talk about reminders, definitely. So, as simple as it sounds, the, the, the whiteboard behind me, um, the sticky note on my computer monitor, the to-do list that I, I put into Evernote or Asana or Microsoft Outlook or Google Docs, whatever your team is using right now, when it comes to reminders, our mind is looking for whenever we're planning and engaging. One is the noun, the topic, the theme of whatever it is we're about to work on. And the second thing that our, our brain is searching for is the verb, the action, the task, the, the step that we need to take. And one of the things that we found is with clients who have set up systems that don't, <laughs> they don't always pull them forward, is sometimes they've mislabeled the verbs and the nouns. Okay. What do I mean by that? A too big verb will actually stop my productivity. What's a too big verb? Plan, finish, create, handle, set up. 
So now I want to take a look at that and go, okay, Jason, what would be the step I would take that would move me toward planning that, toward handling that, Mm -hmm. toward organizing that? And remember, we talked a little bit earlier about that 15 minute, that magic 15 minutes. You know, I didn't put this out loud, but I'll connect a dot. There's 96 15 minute blocks of time in a day. That means 15 minutes is about 1% of my time. Mm -hmm. So by taking a look at how I'm setting up my reminders, are they reminders that are set up with me in mind? Do they manage, do, can I manage my interruptions appropriately? Can I manage my environment appropriately? And is taking that action going to move us forward on that, on that overall picture? Right. So what should I, what should we do then? Cause I do that a lot. I go create blah, 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 you know, create a web page or create this. What would be a couple of the, so I put in my mind some of those more action oriented things. Easy. Look at the ones that have been on your to-do list for maybe 24, 48, 72 hours that you haven't even touched. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the real clue is if you rewrite something on another to-do list, or if you're in a digital system, if you're changing the due date to a further date. So I know in a lot of systems... I do that I all the time. Electronically, <laughs> if I put a due date on something, if it becomes due, it turns red. So what a lot of people will do to fix that is they'll just move the due date to, an, to another day. So what I want to do is I want to take a look. First of all, is what I wrote down, has it moved in the past 24, 48, or 72 hours? And if not, I want to break it down one level. If I'm rewriting something or if I'm moving that due date, I want to take a look at, can I bring that down one more level? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I want you to talk a little bit about the visualization. I thought that was... You know, really interesting because uh, oftentimes we, you know, I could see that it's applicable to sports, but we don't often visualize our uber productive day. So I want you to get back to that. You know, Jeremy, I, I, I appreciate two things. One, I appreciate you sharing that question. And number two, I really appreciate that you and I get along. Okay. Watch, watch where I'm about to go. I believe people are visualizing all day long. I believe people get in their car and visualize a lot of traffic. I believe a lot of people uh, walk up to an ATM and visualize not a lot of money in in their bank account. Mm. Uh, I believe people visualize walking up to someone already imagining they're not going to want to talk to them. And I'm not talking about Pollyanna, um, you know, hopeful thinking or or motivated, I can do it. Um, What was that um, Saturday night skit? You know, the Saturday night. uh, Yeah, Stuart. Yeah, 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 I know it. (laughs) What I'm talking about is putting my mindset in a place that says I'm prepared for whatever it is I'm going to step into. I acknowledge all the reality around me. Uh, Just last week, I was working in the Bay Area advising a couple of companies in San Francisco and Palo Alto, and here's the the truth, Jeremy. Here's the truth. It takes about an hour to go about 10 miles in traffic. It just does. And anybody who thinks I can, you know, first of all, anybody who who doesn't think about that, I'm going to worry about them a little bit. And But anyone who thinks that they're not visualizing whatever it is that's been, been, been uh, showing up around them, what I want to do is I want to move to the other side. So let me give a solid example because I know people always love those. Uh, how many of you have to give a presentation in the next week or two weeks? So one of the things that I do, I I speak about 10, maybe 15 days a month uh, around the world. I'll I'll be in China this year, I'll be in Europe this year, I'll be in South America this year, and all all over the United States. I make a point to get to the venue early, one day, four or five hours. And what I'll do, Jeremy, is I'll ask them to let me in so I can stand on the stage, so I can look out over an empty room or maybe the filling room. Sometimes I'll be a, in a lineup of speakers. I'll actually get on the stage while another speaker is getting her or himself ready just so I can see what is it going to look like when I get out there. Yeah. Number two, whenever I'm giving a speech, whenever I've been invited to talk for a, a group, 
I turn around and I sit somewhere in the audience so I can visualize what it's going to be like looking at the presenter and having that information come at that person. So for me, it's a dual part. It's not just mental, but it's putting myself in a physical place so that I can engage. And there's a bit of familiarity to it. I don't know if I right. said that right. There's, yeah. it, it's familiar. right? It's like, oh, I've been here before. Yeah, yeah. No, I love that. We could all do that. You know, if we have a meeting or a presentation, we just kind of go in the room, visualize it from both ends of it. What's now? I want to hear about some of the. I know you have a lot of tools, different software, high tech, low tech, that you use to stay organized. What are some that you could share with us that uh, we should be using too? And just know we kind of date stamp this conversation because all of this stuff evolves and, and changes up. Right. Um, but in no particular order, you know, there's there's four of us on on the the Jason Womack Company team, and we've really been pushing on Asana project management lately. Asana.com. Okay. I know okay. you'll put a link to all of these. Mm -hmm. And what I have found is it's an amazing way not just to track that we're working on projects. But when I open up the specific project, when I look at the task of that project, over on that other right-hand side, it gives a full conversation. Jeremy, we've actually replaced a lot of our emailing back and forth amongst the team by putting comments on projects in that lower right-hand area. I'd estimate that we're down, pro within the team, I bet we're down five to ten emails a day fewer right now yeah, it's a lot. and with four people you know on the low side that's 20 emails on the high side that might be 40 or 50 emails that we've cut out of our of our having to send to one another for sure um, I'm a huge fan of Google Alerts so I've been talking about this using this forever as far as practical application um, when I found out about Mixergy I, I joined um, I watched a few classes and I set up a Google Alert I set up a Google Alert for Andrew. I set a Google Alert for um, online learning, you know, just to kind of consume all those things. So to this day, let's see, on the professional side, whenever I get a client, I will put the name of the client in a Google Alert. Mm -hmm. I started adding one a few years ago, and I made a, a dual Google Alert where it was the name of the company, the word and, promote, but I spelt promote P-R-O-M-O-T. So now what Google will do is it'll search for that company name, promote, promoting, promotion, promotes, mm. or promoted. Mm. And I'll find out if managers have been promoted, if they're promoting some new thing, um, if uh, all, all kinds of notes about that one topic. And then uh, real quick, just on the on the personal side, I race triathlon from May till October, and every race I sign up for, I always put a Google Alert in so that I can find out, you know, is there anything else going on in that city I'm racing in? Is there anything right. I need to know about the race? Um, I'm, I'm looking at the list here that we yeah. made. Uh, I use a, a, an online a website, a timer. I can set my phone for the countdown timer. But there's one that I love called eggtimer.com, e.ggtimer.com. And the reason I like that one is that when I type in the you know 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, whatever it is that I want to stay in, it actually fills my whole computer monitor with a countdown clock. And it does make it obvious that if someone walks toward me, we've kind of made this deal. If they see that countdown clock counting, the hold on the interruption. So it's been a really neat way to visually create a little bit of space. That's uh, great. Behind yeah. me, the whiteboard. Uh, don't leave home without it, you know, if possible. When I am in a in a uh, hotel, I'll use a dry erase whiteboard pen on the mirror of the hotel bathroom or on the window of the sliding glass door. Both great ways to think big. Um, the mirror one is interesting because I'll, do, I'll use that for a lot of goal setting, for a lot of intention setting, because I like to write and see myself. And I'll use the window when it's time to think big. Uh, I stay in, in New York City. I'm in New York about a week a month, and I always get a, a high floor. And, you know, there's something about brainstorming looking over Soho, Manhattan. It's like, okay, you know, what am I building for her, for him? What, what's that company going to do with this new product? 
And then just one more, no, two more. Uh, I've been a huge fan of the hardback journals. Um, I, currently, I'm using a Moleskin journal, but I've used spiral bound, leather bound, uh, the white lines. Essentially, I've still found to this day that it's so quick to get an idea, throw it on paper, move it around, scratch it out, come up with another idea, that then that becomes the blog post or the speech introduction or the podcast. And then speaking of writing, um, I do send at least one thank you card a day, every day of my life. And what I've done is off to the side of my desk, I just have a stack of these things. And what I do is I stamp them. I use the forever stamps here in America. Um, you can buy stamps that are good forever at the current price range. And then I just put this the thank you card so that's ready to go. And, um, you know, today I booked a meeting with a potential client in New York. And the woman that I'm meeting with, her assistant brokered all of the interactions. So I wrote a thank you card to the assistant saying, hey, you know, you make the world go round. Thanks for finding time on the calendar. That's great. I love it. And I, I also love always when you say the the um, one in the bathroom mirror. You know, I, I've heard you say that, and I it just I love it because it, you said one time it's the first thing you see in the morning, last thing you see when you go to bed, and so you know I've done that a few times just on on that alone. So, but all those are great I mean, tools. Real, real yeah. quick, real quick, Jeremy, let me just blend a couple of things, right? So we have the intention setting, the goalization. Uh, when I travel in in my little um, bathroom kit, you know, I've got my shave cream and my toothbrush and my deodorant and a whiteboard pen and what I've done for the past gosh 12 years I've been doing this when I check into a hotel on the mirror of the hotel bathroom I write a sentence of why I'm working for that client yeah. what I hope to share with them what I hope they gain by having us work together and then to your point it's the last thing I look at it that night the next morning I'm getting ready for the day and I'm looking at me I'm looking at what I wrote I go work for the client and then it's assessment time, right? Later right. in the afternoon, I come back. How did I do? And I have to look me in my eye. How did I do? Right. Yeah, I love it. So, I mean, there's some really actionable tactics, some great tools. So sometimes it could be overwhelming because there's so much great information. What's one thing right now that the audience should do just, get, just to get started, to do right now to be productive? Pull out a pen, pull out a piece of paper, and by the way, I encourage pen and paper for this activity because it'll slow your mind down a little bit. And cast into the future, I don't know, maybe 18 months, 24, 36 months out, doesn't matter the date, but I need it to be far enough out so it's a little bit fuzzy. And what I'd like you to do is to look back after that time span and write down what I call an ideal day. An ideal day is not the perfect day. It's not the one day you save up your life for. An ideal day is you wake up in the morning, you go through that day, and you do the kinds of things that really, the kinds of things that you're on the planet for. So that when you get to the end of that day, as you're writing this, and your head hits the pillow, and you're about to fall asleep, you look back and you go, wow, that, that was an ideal day. And if you're like most people I work with, your ideal day, the one that you'd write, is going to include some life stuff, some work stuff, some personal stuff, some community stuff. And the first thing that I can encourage you to do is to draft this out. Give yourself about 400 words, so it's about two pages back to back, and really let yourself envision and visualize what that ideal day would include, what it would incorporate, uh, how you would be, where you would be, who would be around you, who would not be around you. And that way you can start to see for yourself the direction that you can go in. Uh, probably the, the, I won't say the best advice, some really good advice I got a long time ago is someone said, you know Jason, the purpose of setting goals is not necessarily to get to the goal, but it's to get you moving toward a new there. Mm -hmm. And the ideal day process is you building new theirs. Yeah, I love it. Well, Jason, I appreciate your time. And I know there's one story about the ideal day that, um, about that couple. Do you want to tell that? 
Oh man! So I I, um, I write a column for a local newspaper here in in Ventura, California, and it's kind of a small business leadership column where we uh, we get questions from the people and then um, almost like a dear Abby, you know. So dear Coach Womack, and I got one, and I'll paraphrase it, but essentially the question, the prompt was. Uh, dear Coach Womack, uh, my my wife and I started our company about five years ago, and for the past 60 months, we've gone in full bore, 50, 60 hours weeks, working on the weekends, and he said, we're very successful. The problem that he gave me was, there's always this third wheel when they go to dinner or when they go to a walk, when they're just in the living room, when they're watching TV, right over here is always the business. And they basically said, how do we not talk about our our work when our life is our work? Right. And so what we had them do is we had them sit down to apart and they both scripted out and I had them push a little bit further out another five years so we're you know we're doing this recording in 2013 I said look 2018 I want you to look back and describe a day that you had in those five years it could have been a day tomorrow uh, but it could have been a day in 2017 and what wound up happening is they both wrote down and became very clear about why they were in the business in the first place and again they're gonna talk about their work what I was trying to get him to think about was instead of talking about the current client, the current economy, the current vendor, let's talk about something a little bit, mm, visualize it, if you will. Here's right. where we're going, here's where we're bringing us uh, f forward in that thing. So again, it's not like you're going to go to dinner and anybody who's an entrepreneur, you know, I mean, you don't just forget about your work. Right. What I like to look at is how am I thinking about what I'm thinking? Yeah, I love it. Well, thank you, Jason, so much. I've gotten a lot out of it. As you talked about the thank you cards, if you got anything helpful, which I'm sure you did, reach out to Jason, say thank you, check out his Absolutely. book, and uh, we appreciate your time, Jason. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Have a great time. Good luck out there.